evening, dear ones. Welcome to our Kirtan and Stories. Let's begin now with a prayer together. You can repeat these words out loud if you feel to, or in your heart. The Divine Mother, Heavenly Father, Beloved Friend God, Great Masters of Self-Realization, Jesus Christ, Babaji Krishna, Bahiri Mahashaya, Swami Sri Yukteswarji, Beloved Guru, Paramahansa Yogananda Ji, all saints and sages of all times and traditions, with the deepest love and devotion, we bow at thy feet. Divine Mother, we offer to thee the melody of our heart's love, the reflection of thy love flowing through us. We are thy children, longing to be one with thee, longing to know thee. Free us in thy light, now and forever. We are thine, be thou eternally ours. Om, peace, amen. So, dear ones, this evening we will chant together and share some stories. This is a little bit of a prelude to an event that will come a week from tonight, which will likely be in person. It may, some of it may be streamed, uh, but that remains to be seen. But please come in person. But come in person if you can. It's, these kinds of events are are difficult to convey on a video stream. Um, this will celebrate Krishna, Janamastami, Krishna's birthday. And this evening we'll, we'll sing a few Krishna chants and tell some stories as a, as a lead in to that. But as we do in all our kirtans, we will chant together and we invite you to sing out loud, even though you're, we're not in person offer your heart's devotion into the process and into the practice. It's a hundred times deeper when we actually engage ourselves. This is not a concert. This is a, a deep sharing from soul to soul and from soul to God. Remember that we are singing to God. We're not, not, I mean, in some ways we're singing about God, but chanting is really singing to God. And another way to look at it is chanting is singing with God. Feel that there is this divine presence animating our hearts and our lives. And it's the devotion of our hearts that makes life worth living, gives real power to anything that we're doing. And so offer yourself into that. In between the chants, there will be a little pause. It can be perhaps just a few seconds. It might be up to a minute or more. And we'll have one meditation later on that'll go for maybe five minutes or so. But feel during those little periods, those little moments of pause in between, feel that you are assimilating the energy and the vibration of the chant that just concluded. You can continue those words mentally for a little while, but just try to absorb that feeling. These chants are doorways to the infinite. The first chant we're going to do this evening is I am Om. Omnipresence I am Om, all pervading I am Om. Om, Om, come to me. Come to me, oh, come to me and feel that we are calling to the divine. Om is cosmic creation. Om is Amen. Om is the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, that which draws us back into union with God. And so feel that blessing as we chant. Om is a living presence, a living being in our hearts and lives. And and yet, we have to invoke that by concentrating on it and focusing on it. 
So we'll begin now with that chant and feel that divine blessing in your heart.
We'll sing a Krishna chant now. Hare Hare Krishna. This is a melody that Swami Kriyananda wrote for the classic words.
this next chant into a short meditation. And this is, O God beautiful, at thy feet, O I do bow. And the first verse is all about God in nature. In the forest thou art green, in the mountain thou art high, in the river thou art restless, in the ocean thou art grave. The second verse is all about God in our hearts, God in our own lives, and in our own human experience. Oh, I 
So, in honor of Krishna, we want to tell a couple of stories. And it would be good to think of Krishna and chant to him during the coming week. His uh, Janmashtami is coming up in the next few days. We celebrate it Friday just so that more people can come, but the actual date is, is sooner than that. So just keep him in mind, meditate on that incredible incarnation of God. And this is a story that is about Brahma and Krishna. Brahma is one of the trinity of great gods, Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva in the Hindu mythology, and very sweet. So, here we go. The cowherds are out with Krishna tending their herds of cows. They found a place full of clear sands near running water where the black bees hovered over the lotuses and beautiful birds flew about amongst the branches and the air was filled with drowsy humming someone suggested that here they might take their morning meal the proposal met with acceptance from all and they sat down on the sands to eat but since none could bear to take his eyes off of Krishna the assembly when it was ranged for eating looked like a single great lotus with Krishna at its center and so seated using flowers and leaves and pieces of fruit and bark as plates they all with much merriment began to feast all unknown to them they were being watched by the great god Brahma who had seen the miracle that had been happening around Krishna and was of the mind to play a trick upon them. He wanted to find out whether this boy Krishna who could do such extraordinary things was in reality human or divine. He suspected him of being an incarnation of the god Vishnu and he intended to put the matter to proof. When the boys, therefore, sat down to eat, the god Brahma quickly and quietly drew away their herds of cattle and shut them up in a deep cave in a mountain. He put them to sleep. And when the lads looked up suddenly and saw to their terror that all the cows had disappeared, Krishna jumped up and said that he would find them and drive them back if only the rest would not disturb themselves. He had no sooner left, however, to seek for the missing cows than Brahma took all the herd boys and the herd girls and throwing them into the same deep sleep shut them up also along with their cattle in the same cave and Krishna, returning disappointed, could find no one. A few moments passed in perplexity, and then he, who could see all things, determined that this must be of some dilemma proposed by Brahma, the Creator, and resolved on a course of action. That night the same number of cows and the same number of calves were driven into the village as had left it for the forest in the morning. The herd girls also and the herd boys also went home, all to their own places. But never had the people loved their children and their animals as they now began to do. It was wonderful, this love that was drawn out by the herds and their keepers. Hitherto, people had been tempted to love the Lord Krishna and even his brother Balarama more than their own children. But now, all their hearts were centered in their own homes and for the love of their own children and their own cows. It seemed 
almost as if they would have forgotten the Lord himself. In fact, Krishna had made all of them out of himself. All alike were his special manifestation. And he, the Lord, was now present in his own form in every household, in every cattle pen. So matters continued for a whole year. Now a day of the gods is a year of men. <clears throat> and Brahma, coming at the end of his day, came to see what Krishna had done to meet his trick. And he found, to his amazement, that, were, that there were now in the forest as many herd girls and boys and animals and calves as ever before. But drawing nearer still, it appeared to Brahma as if each of these were somehow clothed in yellow garb and carried a flute and wore the circlet with the peacock's feather just like Krishna. Behind each, moreover, to his to Brahma's piercing sight, each shone forth with four arms, with the hands holding discus and mace and conch and lotus. Then was he satisfied that the young cowherd was indeed the god Vishnu himself, and Brahma worshipped him. And Krishna had resumed into himself all these manifestations. He re Brahma released from the cave where he had hidden them, the sleeping herdsmen and herds girls and their cattle. And they awoke, knowing not that even a moment had passed. They found him themselves seated at their forest meal as they had been when they disappeared and each remembered only the words that had been on Krishna's lips or the food that had been in his hands at the moment of the vanishing of the cows a whole year before. So we'll do a chant now. Okay. We'll chant, Hey Bhagavan. And I will fix the camera.
So this is a story about, <coughs> again, the gopis with Krishna. The most wonderful thing about the gopis was the love that they had for Krishna. They romped and frolicked and tended the herds in the beautiful forests of Brindaban. It was a love without any selfishness. When Krishna was near, they felt themselves lifted into a golden atmosphere <clears throat> where all was gaiety and lightness of heart, nothing seemed serious or troublesome, and their happiness bubbled over in the form of gentleness and play. If one were eating some delicious fruit and suddenly saw the luminous form of Krishna, she would unconsciously offer it for the ne very next bite to his lips instead of to her own. Yet each was only kinder and more faithful to others by reason of this wonderful play, this divine Leela. For it is written that the homes of the gopis never suffered for the, the girl shepherds, the girl herds girls, their husbands and their children never cried in vain. They never fled away from any duty in order to indulge in the company of Krishna. And not those of the gopis also, but also of the humble homes about Brindaban were made happy, all were made happy by his presence. In truth, Krishna the cowherd, or Hari, as he was called, was the Lord himself. And this love of the peasant folk for him was neither more nor less than the love of human souls for the divine. None who ever sported with him or listened to his playing of the flute beneath the trees could bear thereafter to leave his holy presence. The souls of all such were bathed in holy peacefulness and joy but their hands were rendered only the more helpful, their hearts more tender, their feet more eager to run on swift errands of mercy to others. For the fact that in mind and spirit they knew themselves to be playing always with God in the beautiful form 
of the cowherd of Brindaban. So I'll share a little bit <coughs> of a, a, a little bit of a story and some few thoughts to go with it. Um, this is in reference to Krishna, but also in a sense, you can zoom in a little more. So when I first encountered the concept of Krishna, it was, it was not a super comfortable way because I was, I remember being accosted in train stations and airports by people trying to sort of tell me I had to do something in particular. I had to worship God in a certain kind of way. And, and it was related to Krishna. And so I, in, initially I sort of had this bad taste in my mouth. But what I realized later was that the Krishna that they were all talking about was the nearest and dearest. Just as the stories Nirmala is relating show that that presence is so close and so dear and so loving that naturally you want to share it with other people, you want to offer it. It's just that people name that presence differently around the world. People in the Christian tradition think of Jesus in that way. And people, other people with gurus or other people in other traditions think of their particular connection as the one that draws those feelings out. And I thought to share uh, a kind of impression. This is not. This is less of a a specific story than kind of a a memory that I hold in my heart. I remember throughout many years, starting in the late 70s and and on from there until the 2000s, being with Swamiji in. A, a, a satsang situation, a class situation, perhaps he was teaching, often he was teaching, and often there was a subject related to it. You know, he might be teaching meditation, he might be teaching how to live your life in such a way that your life supports the meditation that you're practice, that you're trying to uh, evolve or, or develop whatever the subject might be. It might be something about relationships. It might be something very otherwise kind of mundane, how to, how to run a business in a spiritual way. I just remember this feeling, this vibration, being in his presence. And the vibration was one of, first of all, absolute safety and security and this sense of connectedness. I remember having this powerful thought because, you know, growing up in the West, in America, there's a, there's a natural caution around spirituality. I suppose it's the tradition that many of us were raised in, myself in the Christian tradition, you know, beware of false prophets, sheep's clothing, tumpy tumpy tum. And I remember applying that a little bit to Swamiji and thinking, okay, does he really know what he's talking about? And the answer always came back resounding in my heart. He speaks from his experience. He speaks what he knows. It's not a theory. It's not a sort of something that he read in a book and he's just sharing what he read to us. He spoke with pure authority 
not authority that someone gave him or some priestly position ascribed to him. He spoke with the authority of knowing. And somehow that was so comforting and just the feeling that he understood and could relate from that experience. And I just remember so many situations with him. I, I suppose more of them came later in the years when we lived with him in India, but, but also in other situations where we were dealing with the unknown, we were dealing with uncertainty. I remember um, the original Gulf War broke out. Nirmala and I at that time lived in Ananda, Seattle. And we were just forming a community. We were just getting, uh, getting the land for the community there, the apartment complex, beginning to develop it. I mean, it was a, it was a very pivotal time in our history because we, we were going from an ashram house with a rented center to, we were all going to move into this whole bunch, whole group of us, several, you know, several dozen of us were going to move into this apartment complex. It, in, it involved an enormous financial commitment and war broke out in the Middle East. And I remember Swamiji released, uh, he gave a satsang, he wrote an article, the article got um, transmitted. I think we were. It was the early days of email, but it came out immediately. We printed it up and passed it around. And his response was very, both very practical, but he was also very reassuring. And basically, it was the perspective of a long life, and really, we could say many, many lifetimes, of leading people, guiding people, and just giving confidence to people saying, you know, this could lead to in, in I don't think God was giving him sort of infinite foresight. We, he was, in some ways, he was dealing with the uncertainties that we all were dealing with, and yet he wasn't, because he knew in his heart that the masters are in charge of this world. And it, so, going back to the story Nirmala shared with the cowherds, who you know, suddenly their cows vanished. <laughs> suddenly their cows were all gone. I mean, it's like, I mean, if, if that's your business in life, being a cowherd, and suddenly your whole cattle, you know, your whole flock of cattle is gone, herd of cattle, whatever, I, that's, that would be a little devastating. That would be a little daunting. Well, what happens? Krishna stands up and says, I got this. I'll take care of this. And, of course, you know, then the other drama plays out. But in a sense, we are those cowherds. And we can look at this world around us and think, holy moly, my cows are all gone. You know, everything that I based my security on is, like, missing. And what do I do? And what's going to happen? And, oh, my God, it's a terrible mess. And... God in the form of Krishna, God in the form of Christ, God in the form of the Guru, God in the form of our Guru Bhais is saying, it's going to be okay. I'm with you. I'm going to help you figure this out. Learn the lessons that are there to be learned. But, you know, the school, even though it may be challenging, the school is not designed to explode or to, you know, be a disaster. The school is just designed to help us learn something, to help us prove to ourselves, to help us perhaps in a certain degree to prove to other people, but mainly to ourselves. Yes, I have put out the energy, I have learned, and I have grown from the experience. And all the rest of it fades away. You know, yes, there's camaraderie, yes, there's blessing, yes, there's friendship. All of those things are important and valuable, but the school part is designed to teach us and to help us learn and grow. And yes, okay, there's entertainment involved in it too, and this world is also designed for our entertainment. And that's one of the reasons we want to tell stories, is because there is this 
there is the fe- we can all relate to the story. There's this resonance to it. And I'll, I'll just share one story from my own experience. This is a very bizarre story. And it's a little bit off timed in terms of the year because it would otherwise relate to Thanksgiving because it happened at Thanksgiving. But I was in my first few months at Ananda. So this is November of 1979. And someone that I knew somewhat peripherally, but a lady in the community asked if I would go and fetch her car for her from Southern California. She was separated from her husband. Perhaps she was even divorced. I'm not even sure at that point, but she wasn't in a position to go herself. Maybe the connection with him or lack of connection with him was awkward. Whatever. I, you know, I was young and a little naive and I thought, all right, well, sure, it's an adventure and I'd like to go and why not, you know, see a little of California. And it turned out that her husband was in Encinitas and so I got organized around a train ticket. She gave me the money for that and she gave me a little bit of money, not much. He was going to give me the gas money to come back with and the car. So I got on the train in Davis, driving down from Ananda Village early one morning. Got on the train. It was a long train ride, like 17 hours or something, 16 hours. So I got to all the way to San Diego. Now, those of you who know the anatomy of California, San Diego is a little ways away from Encinitas. It's not like right there. And I didn't know at the time that this man was expecting me to get off in Encinitas. I had understood to take the train to San Diego. That's what my ticket was for. I got off in San Diego and there was no one there to meet me. Now, this was 1979, as I mentioned, long before the era of cell phones and email and all that sort of stuff. And I had a phone number for him, which I tried calling and I didn't get him. And I think I left a message for him. That might have been an era when you could leave a message. I'm not even sure that that was true, actually. Whatever it was, I was walking the streets of San Diego without a plan at about 10, 1030 in the night. And not a super great neighborhood either. And I thought, well, I need to find a hotel, which I did. Just by walking, I finally found a hotel. And that hotel, so I had, just to give you an idea of the position of affairs, I had $40 in my pocket. And no credit card. And this hotel cost $20. This was a decent hotel. It was, you know, those of you who can remember back to that era, $20 $20 could get you a decent hotel in San Diego. It was not five star, but it was not zero stars or one star either. So, okay, I put down my $20 and I went up to the room and I spent the night. And you can imagine, perhaps, that I was praying pretty hard right about then. Well, the next day I tried calling that phone number and I wasn't getting it. And came the afternoon and I had a decision to make. Was Was I going to put put my second $20 down on another night, or was I going to do something else? And I opted for the something else, which was to go down to a homeless shelter and spend the night there in the homeless shelter. And I was fasting that day, because perhaps I had breakfast included in the hotel, but but whatever it was, I think I had some change in my pocket, too, which I was feeding vigorously into the phone. Oh, and the other thing I was doing is I was calling Ananda. Well, Ananda had two phones in that era. One of them was in the village office, and the other one was at publications up on the hill. And I was trying to get a message to this lady who, of course, didn't have a phone at all. Like, what? What do I do? Well, you know, it took a long time for for sneaker net that's you know you put on your shoes and you hike to the person to give them a message and if they're not there you can't you know you have to stick a note on the door I mean it was 
It was a little halting, shall we say. Well, I was praying really hard, but I spent my night in the homeless shelter with a whole bunch of very strange guys, including one named Gene, who was just bubbling, effervescing with excitement that I, too, was from the Chicago area, because he was from Chicago, where he was known as Gene the Dancing Machine. And I kid you not, <laughs> this is the, anyway, there, I, it was a strange group that night, but I spent the night, I won't say that it was sleepless, I will not say that it was the most restful night that I ever had in my life, came the following morning, and I had finally reached out to my dad, I got through to my dad, who was just about apoplectic with fear and outrage and grief and horror and all the fatherly things that a father could have. You know, he was trying to figure out how to wire money to me through Western Union and anyway, it was you know, a whole drama on his end, I'm sure. But interestingly, he was the one who actually cracked the thing because he actually got this guy on the phone. I had given him the, the phone number of the fellow. So going back to the timing of all this, I left on a Tuesday. So my first train ride was Tuesday all day to, till Tuesday night. Thursday was Thanksgiving. So I spent Tuesday night in the hotel. Wednesday I was partly in the hotel and partly at the this shelter. And then Wednesday night was at the shelter. Well, Thursday morning, I went back to the hotel where I had told them I had left some luggage there and I had said to them if a phone call comes through for me please keep a message for me well they had a message for me which was that this guy was going to come and pick me up at 11 o'clock in the morning and I zoomed right back to the homeless shelter which is where he was going to pick me up and sure enough in due course he zoomed up in a black Porsche 911 and you know the guys at the place whoever was left there at that hour most people had gone along on their way but there were a few there standing around kind of in stunned amazement that I who had spent the night before in the shelter with them was now zooming off in this Porsche we stopped at the hotel we picked up my luggage and then off we, we went to Encinitas and at, at about 120 miles an hour, you know, in this Porsche that he liked to drive. Anyway, I tell all this because that, that period of time from Tuesday night until Thursday morning, Thanksgiving Day, as you might imagine, was a period of rather intense prayer and internal cleansing and, and, and a certain degree of what is it? Why am I going through this? Well, partly I was going through it so that I could tell the story today. Partly I was going through it because Divine Mother was teaching me to have a little bit of common sense and perhaps a little bit more caution than I had in my enthusiastic youth that as to the reliability of people, as to the reliability of getting the details right like they matter like stop in Encinitas instead of going all the way to San Diego etc etc but I spent Thanksgiving my Thanksgiving dinner was in a restaurant where I had one of the strangest conversations that I've ever had in my life where this man's girlfriend was trying to explain to me that God had changed from the Old Testament of the Bible till the New Testament of the Bible. Because in the Old Testament, he was a God of wrath. And in the New Testament, he was a God of love. And I briefly, we're talking like maybe two sentences, I briefly debated this point. I got absolutely nowhere and I thought, okay, as far as this lady is concerned, God changed, whatever. I was just the best I could do to say, you know, Tomorrow morning, I'm going to get on the road with this car. It was a stick shift, and I was not very good at driving stick shifts yet in my life, but I learned, <laughs> I learned a lot driving 500 miles 
for 600 miles from Encinitas back to Ananda. But that feeling of rescue and comfort, of knowing that the Divine has us in hand. We live on the lap of Krishna, on the lap of the Divine Mother, on the lap of the Guru, on the lap of however, the lap of God. And sooner or later, we will come to know that. Even if the situation, even if the circumstances may get really adventurous, really unpredictable, really unusual, unexpected, etc. That blessing is there. And I was so happy to get back to Ananda when I finally made it. I drove the entire day on Friday, made it all the way back up to Nevada City and back to Ananda Village, pulled in and, you know, so, sort of celebrated a late Thanksgiving with, with friends. And Divine Mother did rescue me from my, my folly, from my enthusiasm, but it was also just a way of learning that she's always with me. She's always with us. So I'll close off my story there. And we can sing another chant or two. Why don't we, actually, why don't we sing Jai Guru? This is Master's chant. Master's melody, <clears throat> classic words, but victory to the guru means victory to that living divine presence that has manifested in the world. Can you flip that thing around? Manifested in the world for us. To have a personal and human connection with the divine. Otherwise, it stays as theory. It stays as a a potential, but with the Guru's presence in our lives, we can actually come to know the living reality of God's presence. Jai Guru, Jai Guru, Jai Guru, Jai. Jai Guru, Jai Guru, Jai Guru, Jai 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 Jai Guru, Jai Guru, Jai Jai Guru Jai Jai Guru Jai
Thank you for joining us. Thank you for joining us. Do I go to work? And keep Krishna in your mind. Hope to see you next week in person.